Hello and welcome back to the fish locker out on the shore. Now it is a not so warm December morning and we're out for a, what are we doing? Foraging. We've come out to try and do a little bit of foraging. Now we've come to an area of rocky shore just to have a look about. Uh, we've got a decent sized low tide today and we've got about another hour of the ebb so it's going to go out for another hour. Um, let's go and see what we can find. What have you got with you there? What's in your boot? James has got his foraging spear. We've got our lucky foraging bucket and um, fingers crossed we'll go and find something. One of the things that we've got plenty of on this piece of shore is mussels. If you can see behind me, see how they're all clinging into the crevices? Now, that is about as small as you want to take them. So all we'll have to do is we'll just look through and we'll find the big ones. So that size and bigger. We've also got some dog whelks. You've got plenty of them, you can see them all around. And some anemones. And quite a few limpets. Do we get sea urchins here? Yes we do. We do get sea urchins here. We might even find one today if we're lucky. So we'll work our way along, see if we can't find some good ones. There is a really pretty anemone in there. See? There's quite a few of them about the place. There's another one. These are called elongated coral weed. You get quite a lot of pink coral weeds. In fact, that dog whelk is encrusted in it. There's a little tiny snake locks an enemy on there. And these that you can see. These here are dog whelk eggs, so they are the eggs of all of these. It's quite a nice striking one. They do come in a few different colours, you can see. And they eat mussels. There's a load of eggs up there. There, a little green wagworm. Let's go and have a look. We might find a crab in one of these, one of these holes. I don't know if you can see these on here. But that's called a blue reared limpet and they are stunning. See if I can't get a photo of that for you. And the dahlia is an enemy. You see in there? See those two crabs? Aha. There we are, look. A male and a female. You can tell because when you turn them over a male has got a narrow V and a female has got a wide one. See the difference? Between the wide and the narrow. Also look at the claw size difference. This one here is about ready to peel because you can see there She's got a little leg that's just growing back. In there, look. So what he'll be doing, put them back in there. They're too small to take. 
they're smaller than they're too small to take minimum landing size will probably be about that big so about that much more so we'll put them both back in there well, that's what you're looking for like a little crevice and that little hook all you do is just pull them out In here there's some lovely looking dahlias and enemy. There's another one here. Jeez. Then. Give it a good pull, come on, use your big strength. Turn it over. Wow, now oh, that is a nice one. Oh, that is a lovely shell, isn't it? Yeah. What is it? What type of shell is it? A twam. It's a scallop shell. Yeah. Put that in our bucket. Let's have a look around here and see if we can't find anything in these rocks. This here, if you can see it, like a dark tree, just there. That's the back end of a sea cucumber. There's a little crab. Yeah, that sea cucumber there. I don't know if you can see them up there, but there are some cushion stars and some cowries. Little cushion stars. And that is a little native two spotted cowrie. These were actually two different species of cowrie. The smaller spotted one is the European cowrie, and the larger, whiter one is an Arctic cowrie. Now, the cowries. They were used at one point as currency back in the olden days. They're gorgeous, aren't they? The dog whelks that we were looking at earlier on, the ones that are all up in all these crevices here with all their eggs, they're a predatory dog whelk. They eat things like limpets and mussels. They climb up on top of them and drill a little hole in them and they eat the insides. They are fascinating, but also one of the things that I think is incredible on this beach is the diversity in colours. See all these here, all of those there, all of those different colours is all the same species of shell. Yeah, look, some pink, some white, some orange and white, some black and white, some brown, even found a purple one. They're all that same species there. Incredible, isn't it? Isn't nature just amazing? When you're collecting any shellfish, you never want to take everything that's there. So when you find a bunch like this, just take one or two from a bunch. That way, your foraging is incredibly low impact. Taking one out of that group there, they won't even notice. They can continue to breed and carry on. I'll take that one as well, actually. So. Just take one or two from every bunch. 
don't take everything from a single place when you've got this many when there's this many you're not going to touch them anyway you could take a bucket full and they wouldn't even realize oh james has found a monster one haven't you come on sorry i've got you i'm gonna grab it and put it in bucket we need to pull hard on it though go on oh that was a monster one wasn't it that was a good one also picked up a lure i don't know who's been fishing with a spinner with a wire trace i think they've probably been hoping for a barracuda oh there's another good one let's keep looking see if we can find any more some big limpets isn't there oh there's one there's a big one there's a big one yeah. You found another monster one, haven't you? Go on. Yeah. Get it pulled up then. Ah. Well, it's stuck strong. Yeah. Give it a good pull then. <clears throat> you need some help. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they can be really well stuck with those beards there. See? This one's got an enemy on it. Oh, I can see another big one over here. That's all now, so it's that good. I'll get it for you, there you go. Right, we've managed to get a fantastic collection of mussels. And all I'm going to do now is, you can see with some of them, that they have got little bits of seaweed and barnacles on them. So I'm going to sort through them all. I'm just going to tip them into this rock pool here. And this is where I'll sort through the bits of rubbish that were that picked up while we've been out. That's a lovely scallop shot. Some of them, as you can see, they're absolutely clean. There's nothing on them. They can go straight in the bucket. But the ones that have got a bit of barnacles on, what you can do is if you get two of them together, you can rub them together. And it breaks the barnacles off or you take the back of a knife take the back of your blade and just clean it all off there so I'll go through and I'll grade them and I'll just keep all the best ones and I'll leave leave the slightly smaller ones finished up our time on the beach now Hannah and James are just making their way back through the rock poles and I have cleaned off the mussels that we're going to take now I've kept the beards on them because I don't want to kill them and I want to soak them overnight so they've got a chance to purge this is just clean seawater you can see the type of habitat what they like they're up on the open rocks it is fantastic to see this many these are all a little bit small though you don't want to be taking them up until they're about about that big look but yeah we've got a fantastic haul of mussels here mussels are a fantastic thing to, to come and forage like that because they're here year round the, um, the months that you want to avoid them is any month without an R so like May, June, July, August and that's because they're a filter feeder we went way back to the car now before it starts raining and we're going to uh, soak these overnight and then we're going to go see Jim at Spargo's Kitchen and we'll see if we can't uh, rustle up something delicious. We've come to the end of the time on the beach and we have got a fantastic collection of mussels. James is building sandcastles aren't you? There's a man made right there. I think that one looks a bit like an octopus. No it isn't. James also found a stunning scallop shell. I am keeping these in clean seawater to let them purge for a while. I'm going to take these shells now and we are going to... Oh, wow, that is a lovely one. I did actually find another one a bit like that, but a different shape. That is a lovely little one. Queenie shell. Yeah, we're going to let these purge for a while. 
and then we're going to go to Spago's Kitchen and let him cook up something delicious. It's uh, and warm. You call it? Uh, yeah, it's it's not a warm day. Um, mussels are fantastic. They're they're resident all year round. They're stuck to the rocks. The only time of year when you shouldn't collect them is a month without an R. So like May, June, July, August. And that's because they're a filter feeder and there's sometimes, like bacteria and plankton, we get an algal bloom called May bloom, because it's in May. Um, so any of the other months, like now, are perfect for, like, for collecting mussels. So we will see you in a bit. Right, we have the mussels that we collected on the beach yesterday. These have been soaking, purging overnight in clean salt water and I'm just giving them one final once over. That's making sure that I get rid of any barnacles that I've missed and pulling the beards out. Because you need to remove the beards just before cooking. So this little piece here is what it uses to attach to the rocks. Like that. Commonly called a beard, I think its proper name is a byssus. If you grip hold of it, you can pull it out like that. This one's going to show me up, I think it's a little. Yeah, I'll have to go and get them. Yeah. Right, John has wrapped up with some superb mussels he's foraged. So I've gone through the cupboard in the fridge and I'm going to cook them two ways one with cider and vegetables and we'll also make a smoked paprika tomato chowder. Mussels are prepped, barnacles scraped off, beards removed and I've chopped onion, celery, carrot, garlic and a small chilli. How many cloves of garlic do you manage to That was three so I'm going to just I'm going to divide all of this except for the chilies. I'm going to divide this between the two. So we'll start off with a good knob of butter in each pan. And we'll go, sorry, go the wrong way, half the onion. So in this pan, I'm going to sweat down the vegetables and make a cider and cream sauce and in this one it's going to be a tomato smoked paprika. So onions in, carrot and celery, spring onion would be good, chives to finish them off. So I'm not going to salt them because I expect the mussels will be quite salty and we can adjust the seasoning after cooking. So we'll give those a couple of minutes and then I'm going to tip the mussels into the pan and um, cook the mussels. All of these mussels are shut tight. If any are open, give them a tap and they should close up. If they don't, throw them away. We've, we've mentioned that in other videos and that's because if they don't close up again, it's because they're dead. You don't know generally how long it's been dead for, so you need to discard them. So, garlic in, I'm just going to split those three large cloves between the two pans. Chilli in there. So those have been exactly the same, apart from now one of them's got chilli in. Yes, and smoked paprika. And I'm going to put that in the smaller pan. And we'll just let that. It's about half a teaspoon. And we'll just let that cook out quite I've got a bit of boiling water. I'm just going to pop that in the pan to boil it. Just want to generate lots of steam. Now we must have over a couple of kilos of mussels. I would expect that to feed. Main course: three really large portions, four, maybe five, if your appetites are modest. I suppose that'll be the that'll be the guide, won't it? And it, it depends on which you want to eat. So I'm just going to split them in half. The, bigger, the biggest pan you've possibly got. So mussels in and lid on. We're going to leave those for a couple of minutes. I just need
need to. And again, just a little splash of water. Stops everything catching. Generates some steam. Muscles in. Lid on. Right, muscles have had a couple of minutes, so let's give them a stir. Top to the bottom, bottom to the top. Some of them are beginning to open, some are still tightly closed. So there's only just a bit of water in there to generate steam, just not boiling them. It's just no, 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 just, just want some steam. I mean, you could use, we could have used cider, we could have used, if you were going to do them in a French style, uh, you could have put a bit of white wine in there, but... Uh, see, they're all still pretty tightly uh, shut up, so we'll another couple of minutes. Right, they've had a, they've had a, sizable muscles, they've had a scant five minutes. And I'm going to tip them, colander, over a bowl. Gosh, that smells delicious. When the steam has gone away a little bit, I'll go over there, go over these and make sure that every one of them is open. Any that are still tight shut, we must regard those as dead. Throw them away. We don't know how long they've it's, it's not just that, there could be something else the matter with them. The, the thing is, is, there's something not right with them. So I'm just going to scrape out the last one. And the, the beauty of these being, you've picked them from the, the rocks off the seashore, is they, they won't have any mud or grit in them. Uh, estuary mussels uh, are notoriously dirty. That is one of the things that we talked about when you were when we were foraging. By collecting them from open coast, from clean coast, sandy coast, they've not got the silt in them. Whereas if you're collecting them from somewhere inside of an estuary, like Jim was saying, generally they do harbour quite a bit of mud. Right. And there we've got the water and all the cooking juices out of the mussels. So in, in the bowl we've got the, uh, all the juices from the mussels, I've got a very fine strainer and I'm just going to pass that back into the pan and just go slowly because there you can see just a bit of grit. Just to counter it off on you. There we go and I'm going to stop there. So back on the gas. And I'm going to pop some cider in. Sweet, bottle. sweet or dry? Oh, dry cider, medium dry, dry cider would be better. Uh, I'll save that now. Just going to let, let, let that reduce down. I'm going to add some double cream and then I'll return the cooked mussels and the vegetables back into the sauce and we can serve. Just to rewarm them at the end. They'll, they'll still be hot, but yes, just to give them a minute. And these are the mussels in the smoked paprika liquid. Into there. Hot, hot, hot. Right, just going to swill the pan in a bit of water. Just in case there's any grit in the bottom of the pan. Get rid of that. Now we're going to make some tomato sauce. Just straining off the cooking liquor and just going slowly. That's mainly paprika there. But you, can you can see, see the see lighter the stuff whereas the, the grits right, grit right, right at the back. So we'll stop there. And then again we'll let that, let that reduce and just to pump it up a bit I've got some tomato puree, so you just want 
a good smidgen tomato puree, probably a I've caught up with the dishes and the cooking liquors are still reducing and I'm just So you aren't boiling them are you? You're just, just simmering just to good, roast the good, juice. Good simmer, yeah. Not, it's not a hard... Like a, yes. Anyway, we want to reduce them by about half. And I'm just quartering some cherry tomatoes and I'm going to throw those in to the reducing We've had these liquids reducing, so I'm going to put about uh, this is uh, 600 mils. So I'm going to put about 300 mil in there, and not so much in the tomato one. Perhaps 100, 100 mils, and we'll just let those simmer down and into the cider cream. Lovely. Just, mm. Yes, good job we didn't salt for that. You can just taste the, the sort of brininess from the mussels in that one. So these are the uh, the mussels for the cider sauce. So we'll tip those back in. Mask the vegetables. And these are the mussels for the tomato. I just roughly chopped a bit of curly parsley. And it was just a handful, wasn't it? Yeah, just a handful and a bit. And some soup plates. So the liquid is just has the consistency of, of double cream. So I'll put that one over there for Hannah to start. And then we'll also have some. Again, this tomato sauce is consistency of double cream. It smells amazing. Uh, really does smell fantastic, that. Right, fortunately, Hannah's baked some Cornish, some uh, bread rolls. Do you want to try? Mm -hmm. Do you want to try the liquid? God, these are delicious. I like these tomato ones. <laughs> With fresh made bread rolls. There we are, we've finished everything off. There is nothing left now apart from empty plates and empty shells. Both of those were absolutely delicious. I don't think I could pick one. Um, you said you liked them both as well, didn't you? Did. And um, yeah, the tomato and uh, paprika, I could have eaten a bowl of that, just, just the sauce on its own. I hope you enjoyed joining us out on the shore. It wasn't the nicest day, but it definitely was worthwhile with a forage like that. Thank you very much to Jim for another wonderful cook up. If anybody else has any ideas on how they cook their mussels or any videos you'd like to see us try and attempt in the future, please let us know. In the meantime, all the best and we'll see you later.